stars are right, and that means it's time for another episode of The Whisper in Darkness. I'm your host, the man from Ling. Thank you very much for joining me today. On today's episode, I am reviewing the player cards from the fourth Mythos pack in the Dunwich Legacy Cycle. That's right, we're taking a look at the cards in Undimensioned and Unseen. There are 11 player cards to look at in this review. There are spoilers throughout if you care about that sort of thing. So without further ado, let's get started. We'll kick off our review as we always do with the first Guardian card in the pack. This is If It Bleeds. It's a one cost event with willpower and combat icons. It is fast and it has the game text, play after you defeat a monster enemy. Each investigator at your location heals horror equal to that enemy's horror value. First off, I love the art on this card. I don't know who the shadowy figure is, but they put that fire axe to good use. Secondly, I like this card a lot because it rewards guardians for doing what they do best, which is killing monsters. Anybody who has played Zoe Samaras or Roland Banks knows that they can use all the sanity that they can get their hands on, especially if they've suffered mental trauma due to their respective weaknesses, smite the wicket and cover up. Monsters are fairly common in the Dunwich Legacy campaign, be they Night Gaunts or one of the various flavors of Thralls, so you should have plenty of opportunities to play this card. That's important, I think, because of our current, our current crop of Guardians needs to be careful about which cards they include in their decks because they don't have access to a card like Adaptable. Experience points are precious, are a precious commodity in the Dunwich Legacy campaign, and I would hate to waste them on swapping out level zero cards that aren't uh, particularly effective when I could be spending them on shotguns or other cards that have been spoiled in future Mythos packs. That said, I think it's important to manage your expectations when it comes to this card. Most of the time, you're only going to be healing one horror. The only way you're going to be healing two horror is if you kill the Servant of the Lurker, Emergent Monstrosity, or Brood of yogg uh, The Experiment and Silas Bishop also deal two horror, but I'm excluding them because typically the game, is the game ends once they're dead. So most of the time you are going to be only healing one horror, uh, two horror if you kill one of these, these rare monsters. Uh, obviously, this card gets a little better in uh, multiplayer, where you're healing much more than, than one or two horror. That begs the question, is it worth packing this card to heal one or two horror per game? I'm going to err on the side of caution and say yes. Unlike a lot of healing options available to garden, Guardians currently, if it bleeds doesn't chew up your precious actions, which lets you focus more on investigation and combat, which uh, help you win the game. If it bleeds comes really comes into its own in a scenario such as undimensioned uns and unseen where there is a lot of horror flying around. Obviously, this card is also a lot better in multiplayer, where you can uh, double up on the healing not only for the guardian but also the other players in the game. The next guardian card in the pack is the Springfield M1903. It's a four cost asset that costs four experience points. It has combat and agility icons. It has the item, weapon, and firearms traits. It has three ammo and the text action. Spend one ammo, fight. You get plus three combat and deal plus two damage for this attack. Cannot be used to attack enemies engaged with you. And it takes up both hand slots. The obvious comparison here is with the shotgun from the core set. Both weapons cost four experience points, but the Springfield M1903 costs one less resource to play and swaps a combat icon for an agility icon. The Springfield also gives you one more ammo than the shotgun. Both weapons add three to your combat check, but the Springfield 1903 does at least three damage, while the shotgun's damage depends on how many points you succeed your combat check by to a maximum of five. So which weapon is better, a better choice for the discriminating guardian? Personally, I think the shotgun is the far better choice because of the limitation imposed on the Springfield M1903 by the cannot be used to attack enemies engaged with you clause. 
The Springfield 1903 is a terrible choice for the solo investigator because obviously most enemies automatically engage a solo investigator. Neither Zoe nor Roland have the agility or the actions to spare to first evade an enemy and then shoot it with the Springfield. In fact, the Springfield is an anti-synergistic weapon with Zoe who rewards you with a resource when you engage an enemy. You can't use the Springfield M1903, or any weapon for that matter, to snipe aloof enemies, such as those irritating whippoorwills, since you need to be engaged with them in order to attack them. The Springfield is also a liability in a showdown against a massive enemy, such as Silas Bishop from blood on the altar since massive enemies are considered to be engaged with all investigators at a location. Silas is a particularly bad matchup given this, given his whopping 7 agility. There's no way in hell Zoe or Roland should be wasting resources and actions making a futile effort to evade Silas before attacking him. The shotgun is the clear winner, hands down. The Springfield M1903 is more effective in multiplayer, where other investigators can engage or evade enemies while the Guardian snipes them with the Springfield. The Springfield's damage output is probably more consistent than the shotgun as the difficulty of combat tests increases, and the extra ammo never hurt. You'd probably want to pick up an extra ammunition to get the most out of this gun, however. Although the Springfield M1903 is better in multiplayer, it still seems inefficient because you're counting on your fellow investigators to spend actions to make up for the weapon's inherent weakness. You're also expecting them to engage or evade enemies that the Guardian, with their large health pools, should be engaging in the first place. And if those investigators don't evade the enemies before you shoot them with the Springfield, there's a chance they're going to take three damage to the face, which is likely worse than what the enemy's attack would have been. Unfortunately, massive enemies still pose a problem in multiplayer. A guardian armed with the Springfield is par best paired with an investigator with a high agility who can consistently evade lock a massive enemy. Otherwise, the Springfield could end up being a dead draw and for experience is a lot to pay for a weapon that ends up being useless in combat. Frankly, I'm not very impressed with the Springfield M1903. It's best in multiplayer, and even then it has serious limitations. Perhaps FFG will release an investigator who will shine with this weapon, but I don't think either Guardian we have right now is interested in picking this thing up. Players will be far more tempted to spend their experience on the shotgun or the lightning gun, which will be released in Lost in Time and Space, rather than this thing. The first Seeker card in the pack is Inquiring Mind. It's a skill with a whopping three wild icons. It has the innate trait and the game text, commit to a skill test only if there is a clue at your location. When FFG spoiled this card shortly before the release of Undimensioned and Unseen, my jaw hit the floor. This is yet another amazing addition to the Seeker's arsenal, and it's an auto-include for most investigators who can take it, including Daisy, Rex, and Roland Banks. Much like Rise to the Occasion in the previous Mythos pack, Inquiring Mind is the latest skill to provide three wild icons. I'm sure the other classes will be receiving similar skills in future Mythos packs. I liked Rise to the Occasion in theory, but found it challenging to play effectively in practice because the investigator's base skill must be at least too lower than the difficulty of the skill test. That doesn't happen as often as you might think in some scenarios. For example, Rise to the Occasion was clutching Undimensioned and Unseen while trying to take down a brood of Yongsothoth with Ashcan Pete. In Blood on the Altar, however, it sat in my hand for most of the game until I could pitch it to Reddy Duke. The opportunity cost to play Inquiring Mind is much, much lower than Rise to the Occasion. While some encounter decks punish you for leaving clues on the table with cards like Locked Door, Obscuring Fog, or Thralls, investigators are usually pretty safe to sit on a clue or two at a location if they're unable to collect them all in one turn. Indeed, an investigator like Roland Banks will often leave a clue at a location in order to discover it later for free using his response trigger after combat. If there are no clues at your current location, the Seekers are better equipped than most investigators with cards such as Shortcut, Path, or Pathfinder to reposition themselves at a location with clues, especially if they're expecting to face a key skill test later that turn. I don't really have much else to say about this card. It's great. Put it in your deck and don't look back.
The next secret card in the pack is Expose Weakness. It is a zero cost event that costs one experience point. It has one intellect and two combat icons. It has the insight trait. And it has the game text fast, play during any free trigger player window. Choose an enemy at your location. Test intellect X, where X is the enemy's fight value. For each point you succeed by, reduce that enemy's fight value by one for the next attack performed it against it this phase. This is one of the most fascinating cards in the pack and has some interesting implications in solo and multiplayer. First off, it's important to look at what does this card actually do? Well, it essentially allows a seeker to take cards and resources that would be spent on intellect tests and spend them on combat tests instead. I get the feeling this card is intended to be played in the late game in scenarios where combat outweighs investigation. In short, boss fights. You're not going to be using this to take out thralls or whooper wills, that's for sure. The fact that the enemy's fight value is reduced only for the next attack performed against it this phase also suggests to me that the investigator or investigators want to make that attack as, as effective as possible. And by that I mean big damage. How do they do that? Well, in solo play, a seeker who's sitting on a bunch of clues might play this card to set up a devastating I've got a plan, lowering the enemy's fight value ahead of time to improve the odds that the seeker can hit with that event from the Miskatonic Museum expansion, ideally for the full four damage. Sadly, our current lineup of seekers don't have access to many high damage options besides I've got a plan. Rex decks packing Fire Axe and Vicious Blow might want to consider this card, both for its ability and the two combat icons it provides. This card really shines in multiplayer, although it does require some coordination with your fellow investigators to reach its full potential. For example, a seeker could play Expose Weakness on an enemy to soften it up for a guardian armed with a shotgun. In that case, reducing the enemy's fight value improves the odds the shotgun will hit for the full five damage. No boss, no shotgun, no problem. The Seeker could always pitch this card to a Guardian's fight check against another enemy for the two combat icons. Exposed Weakness could also help an investigator planning to use the trusty backstab double or nothing combo to inflict six damage on an enemy. It's a lot easier to pull off that combo if you're doubling a fight value of two or three rather than four or five. So how does Exposed Weakness work in practice? I think it's important to remember that while the card itself is free, you're probably going to need to spend resources and cards on the intellect check for this card to be really effective. Take the boss fight at the end of Blood on the Altar in standalone mode, for example. Let's assume you've got Roland Banks equipped with a shotgun and Daisy Walker who has Mylan Christopher and a talent such as higher education or hyper awareness. If Daisy plays Expose Weakness on Silas Bishop, she has six intellect versus Silas's three combat. However, the Chaos Bag is particularly harsh at the end of that scenario. The skulls are minus four and the tablets are minus two, but require you to reveal another token. Worst case scenario, you're looking at a minus six if you pull tablet skull. That's pretty unlikely, but it just goes to show how the odds are tipped in Silas's favor. The odds that Daisy will reduce Silas's fight value by three on that intellect test is only slightly better than 22% to start off with. Daisy will probably need to pitch cards with intellect icons or spend resources on talents to improve her chances. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's something you need to be aware of ahead of time. If you're planning on killing Silas anyway, all those spare cards and resources weren't going to do you any good, so you might as well pitch them to improve Roland's chances of shooting Silas in the face for five or six with the shotgun, assuming he plays a vicious blow. Of course, Roland still needs to hit Silas. As I'm sure you're all well aware, the tentacle has an annoying tendency to show up at the worst possible moments, and I think this qualifies as one of those times. All in all, Expose Weakness is an interesting option for Seekers who want to roll up their sleeves and pitch in with combat. The card does require some coordination with other investigators, and depending on the fight value of the enemy in question, it has the potential to be very resource intensive if you're hoping to maximize the value you get out of it. But I think in most cases, Expose Weakness can tip the odds in the investigator's favor during a critical combat. The first rogue card in the pack is Quick Thinking. 
It's a skill with one wild icon and the innate trait. It states, if this skill test is successful by two or more, after it resolves, you may immediately take an action as if it were your turn. This action does not count toward the number of actions you can take each turn. Now, FFG spoiled this card quite a while ago, and I talked about it on a previous episode. It's interesting to take a look at this card again, since players have had a chance to play around with the cards a little more and see how the Dunwich Legacy campaign plays out. Quick thinking is very much in keeping with the rogue theme of action advantage, and it allows investigators to do something they haven't been able to do before, namely take an action on another investigator's turn or during the mythos phase. Basically, it gives you access to, to Skid's special ability for a turn with a much higher risk attached. Now, any card that provides action advantage is worth considering for your deck. Unfortunately, quick thinking is also in keeping with another rogue theme, succeeding by two or more. While I haven't experimented with the whole succeed by two or more deck, I've heard from players who have that it's pretty underwhelming and not really worth the effort. A quick look at the odds demonstrates why that is. It shouldn't really come as a surprise to anyone that as the Dunwich Legacy campaign progresses, the scenarios are becoming more difficult and the Chaos Bag packs a bigger punch to the gut. Take a look at Undimensioned and Unseen on Standalone mode, for example. There are 18 tokens in the bag. The skulls range anywhere from a minus 1 to minus 3. The tablets are a minus 4 unless you remove a clue from A Brood of Yogg-Sothoth, which I think most players would hate to do. And the Elder Thing is a minus 3. So what are your chances of snagging an extra action with quick thinking? Well, this uh, chart gives you some ideas to what your odds are. Uh, assuming there's only one brood of Yogg-Sothoth on the table and you get some bonus from pulling an Elder Sign, you've got a lowly 11.11 .11 chance of success if you're sitting at plus one before the pull. Now, the Cultist is a special token in this case. If you reveal the Cultist, you have to reveal another token. And your odds slightly improve, actually, if you do reveal the, the Cultist first, improving to 11.76%. At plus two, your odds improve to 22.22%. At plus three, they jump to 50%. And at plus four, your odds improve to 61.11%. At uh, plus five, your odds are 77.78%, 82.35% if you happen to pull the cultist token first. Now, obviously, it's difficult to calculate the odds of all the tests an investigator might face during a scenario, but judging by the ones listed here, you're going to want to be sitting at least a plus three, if not a plus four, plus five, if you really want a decent shot at taking an extra action. That probably means you're going to need to commit extra resources and or cards on top of the quick thinking to the test in order to pass it by two or more. Now that's not all that surprising, considering it costs Skids two resources to guarantee himself an extra action. That gives you some idea whether it's worth uh, spending the extra cards and resources. And it also gives you some idea about how the designers value an extra action in this game. So is it worth spending at least one card and possibly a few extra cards and resources on top of that for a Skids-like ability? Ultimately, that depends on what you plan to do with the extra action, which makes this card difficult to gauge. I can see three scenarios. You're going to pitch this card to a test that you're expecting to crush anyway to speed up your tempo a little bit. Investigating a low shroud location or killing rats fit the bill here. Sometimes you're going to play this card and it will give you a chance to flat out win the game. Need that one extra action to resign at the back alley? Scoop up the final clue with the restricted hull or land the killing blow on Silas Bishop? Quick thicking is your ticket. Dumping a bunch of extra resources and cards into a test isn't nearly so bad if it could win you the game. And then there are going to be those games where you're going to wish this card was something stronger because it's essentially a blank skill with one wild icon if the tests get too difficult. And as skill tests become more difficult, quick thinking becomes harder to pull off and a riskier proposition to put in your deck. If you want to play it safe, you're probably better off packing a skill with more raw icons. Who knows, maybe rogues will be getting a skill card with three wild icons in a future Mythos pack. I do think this card is slightly better in multiplayer where investigators are performing a lot more skill tests and the odds are higher of pitching this to one an investigator was going to pass anyway. 
I'd much rather pitch this to an Agnes Willpower test or, an, or a DAISY Investigate test than a similar test by SKIDS, for example. Quick thinking is one of the few ways investigators can generate extra actions, but you need to decide whether it's worth the cost and the risk before you put this card in your deck. The next row card is one of the coolest assets in this pack. This is Lucky Dice, or are they? It's a two-cost asset with the item and relic traits that takes up the accessory slot. It has willpower and agility icons. It's exceptional, which means it costs four experience points and is limit one per deck. It has the game text response. After you reveal a chaos token, spend two resources. Ignore that chaos token and reveal another one to resolve. If that token has the tentacle symbol, remove lucky dice from the game. This card mimics Wendy Adams' ability, and most players already know that ability is amazing. It's important to note here that Lucky Dice's response differs from Wendy's in that you don't return the Chaos token to the dip bag before you reveal the next one, and there is no limit on the number of times that you can use it. As long as you've got the resources to pay, you can keep rolling the dice. If you happen to pull a Tentacle token before you trigger the dice, you can go for broke. I really like the push your luck element built into this card. With each pull, the chance of revealing a tentacle rises by a fraction of a, per of a percent, increasing the chance you'll have to remove the dice from the game. I think investigators need some type of chaos bag manipulation as the scenarios become more difficult, or if you're playing on higher difficulties. Lucky Dice gives rogues another powerful way to tip the odds in their favor. It will be interesting to see whether players prefer spending six experience for a couple of copies of Sure Gamble, or whether, or whether they'll spend four experience for one copy of this. I like the certainty that comes with playing Sure Gamble, both because you're more likely to draw it and all, the, and all but guarantee a positive result when you play it, but I don't think investigators can go wrong either way. My only worry about Lucky Dice is the resource cost. There are a lot of assets and abilities that are competing for a rogue's resources, and this one only adds to that pressure. Ultimately, which card you choose will depend on how many experience points you've got and the build you have in mind. For example, Skids probably won't be picking this up to go along with his police badge, while uh, some an investigator like Jenny would certainly uh, take a close look at this card. The final rogue card in the pack is the level 2 version of Opportunist. It's a skill with one wild icon and the innate and developed traits. It states, commit only to a skill test you are performing. If you succeed by two or more, return Opportunist to your hand after this test instead of discarding it. Well, I was pretty disappointed when I saw this card. Opportunist is among the weakest skills in the core set, and the level 2 version doesn't do much to rectify that problem. I don't think I've ever triggered Opportunist's game text, and the level 2 version improves the odds of doing that only slightly. Opportunist suffers from many of the same problems as Quick Thinking, which I looked at earlier in this review. Most of the time it's going to trigger only on skill tests you're passing easily, which begs the question, why are you playing this on that test in the first place? As the difficulty of skill tests rises, this card basically becomes a blank skill card with a wild icon. And all for two experience points? No thanks. I'll never spend two experience points on this, especially when there are more interesting rogue cards like Lucky Dice in this pack, or Ace in the Hole and Chicago Typewriter, which are coming out in Where Doom Awaits and Lost in Time and Space, respectively. The only thing Opportunist is going to do is gather dust like all the wine pictured in that card. The first Mystic card in the pack is a new ally, Alyssa Graham, Speaker to the Dead. She is a four-cost asset with an intellect icon. She has the ally and sorcerer traits. She gives an investigator a static plus one boost to their intellect, and she has the free trigger. Exhaust Alyssa Graham. Look at the top card of either the encounter deck or any player deck. You may then add one doom to Alyssa Graham to place the looked at card on the bottom of its deck. And she takes up the ally slot and has one health and three sanity. Alyssa and her ability will be no stranger to those of you who have played the Lord of the Rings LCG, which features a character, Hennemarth Riversong, with a more limited form of this ability. Hennemarth is very powerful, uh, is a very powerful addition to solo decks that can play him in that game, and I expect Alyssa will have a similar impact 
in the Arkham Horror LCG. Looking at the top of the encounter deck is a subtle yet very powerful way of tipping the odds in the investigator's favor. Are you unsure of whether to play Rite of Seeking or Shriveling this turn? Peek at the top card of the encounter deck will help you decide whether, you, whether to get down to the business of investigating or shore up your combat options first. And if you're worried about that card wrecking you, you can always add a Doom to Alyssa to send that card to the bottom of the deck. In certain scenarios in which you don't reshuffle the encounter deck that often, that is as good as cancelling that card, which can be huge. I can think of situations in each of the scenarios we've seen so far in the Dunwich Legacy in which Alyssa would be a clutch play. Not ready to face the hunting horror in the Miskatonic Museum? Send him to the bottom of the deck? Emergent monstrosity or night gaunt going to crash your party in the engine car or hidden chamber? Banish them to the bottom of the encounter deck. Towering beasts going to ruin your day? Bye bye Now, typically I'm not a big fan of adding any unnecessary doom to the board, but used judiciously, Alyssa's ability has the potential to flip the game in your favor. You could even combine her ability with scrying to gain an even greater measure of control over the encounter deck, arranging cards in such a way that you can safely bottom the ones you don't like on those turns just before the agenda advances. That would be an extremely powerful tool in the investigator's arsenal. A player can also use Alyssa's ability to peek at the top card of an investigator's deck, although I think this is a weaker play in most circumstances. It could be very powerful in a tight game in which you haven't drawn your weakness slash weaknesses yet. If you're concerned, your weakness could do more damage than any encounter card. Uh, say you've got a copy of Paranoia in your deck and uh, you really don't want to lose all your resources. Making sure it never sees the light of day is a very strong play. Now, Alyssa's ability is quite a bit weaker in multiplayer games because you are drawing a lot more encounter cards. You'll need to play scrying in this situation to give yourself greater control if you're planning on cancelling a lot of those cards. As enthusiastic as I am about Alyssa, I'm not quite sure what deck she fits in at the moment. The static plus one boost to intellect will never go to waste and most investigators would love to have that. However, most Agnes decks prefer to shoot for the level 2 version of Peter Sylvester for the extra willpower icon, so the waitress probably isn't interested in what Alyssa has to offer. That leaves Daisy and Jim, as well as the other Dunwich investigators, and the promo investigator Marie Lambeau. I could see a control-oriented Daisy build that plays Alyssa and scrying to neuter the encounter deck. Picking up a copy of Charisma along the way would allow Dr. Mylan Christopher and Alyssa to team up for a plus two static uh, intellect boost. Alyssa could also shore up Jim's investigation, giving him more control over the encounter deck and the chaos bag. I haven't had a pl chance to play with Marie Lambeau yet, but I know she likes playing around with Doom, so there is the poten some potential there. All in all, I'm really excited about Alyssa, and I think she's going to see a lot of play in solo decks, and I'm looking forward to seeing what players, uh, what kind of combinations players can come up with. The second Mystic card in the pack was spoiled a few months ago. This is the level 4 version of Rite of Seeking. It's a 5 cost asset with 2 intellect icons and the spell trait. It takes up an arcane slot. It has 3 charges and the game text action. Spend 1 charge. Investigate using willpower instead of intellect. You get plus 2 willpower for this test. If successful, you discover 2 additional clues at this location. If a skull, cultist, tablet, elder thing, or tentacle symbol is revealed during this check, after this test resolves, l lose all remaining actions and immediately end your turn. Now, the level 0 version of Rite of Seeking was released in the Dunwich Legacy Big Box, and the level 4 version boosts its stats across the board. It costs one more resource to play, but in exchange for that, you get an extra intellect icon if you need to pitch this card to a skill test, and you get a plus two boost to your willpower and discover three clues instead of two during investigate tests. It's a powerful card, which makes me think it would be somewhat painful to pitch this to a skill test rather than playing it. Now, four experience is a significant chunk of change, Although I think Mystics are better equipped than most classes to pay for something like this if they can tri trigger Delve too deep consistently during some of the easier scenarios early in the campaign. I've been playing a solo Agnes deck through the Dunwich Legacy, and I haven't really felt the need yet for a card like this. 
the level zero version of right of seeking is more than adequate in most circumstances since Agnes's innate willpower is usually much higher than the shroud value on locations, and most locations only have one or two clues. Paying four experience points for the plus four, two willpower boost and three clues seems like overkill, especially if you're not getting full value out of it. Agnes and Jim also have access to Drawn to the Flame if they don't see their right of seeking early or it runs out of charges. Both also have the option of packing Look What I Found to shore up their investigation checks further. Currently, I'm sitting on about four experience points in my Agnes campaign, and I haven't considered this card, which tells me that shoring up investigation isn't really a top priority. That said, my estimation of this card could change significantly depending on the final two scenarios of the Dunwich Legacy campaign. If the Shroud values spike or the token spread and the Chaos Bag de dives deep into the negatives, this card might become an important late pick for Agnes and Jim. Plus two willpower will be vital if you're consistently pulling minus fours from the Chaos Bag at high Shroud locations. Personally, I think this card is better suited to multiplayer where the number of clues on any given location is higher. This card gives Agnes and Jim a chance to keep pace with the likes of Daisy and Rex, who are probably packing the level 2 version of deduction for the same reason. This card's a little hard to judge at the moment because we simply don't know how difficult the final scenarios will be. I haven't felt the need for it yet, but talk to me again after Where Doom Awaits and Lost in Time and Space come out and I might have a different perspective on the value of this card. Dark Horse is the first survivor card in the pack, and I think it's one of the most powerful cards in the Undimensioned and Unseen Mythos pack. It's a three-cost asset with a willpower icon. It's a condition with the game text Limit 1 per Investigator. During the upkeep phase, you may choose not to gain resources. While you have no resources in your resource pool, you get plus one willpower, plus one intellect, plus one combat, and plus one agility. Now don't let the idea of playing without resources scare you. This is an amazing card in the right deck. I've had a chance to experiment with it in an Ashcan Pete deck with a low resource curve, and it's relatively easy to turn on Dark Horse when you need it. The easiest way to do that is to pair it with a talent that lets you spend resources to boost your stats, or a weapon like Fire Axe. If you've got one resource and you spend it on Scrapper for plus one agility, for example, you're actually getting plus two agility for your troubles. In an emergency, you could even use Scrapper to burn a resource to turn on Dark Horse for the plus one willpower or plus one intellect. Dark Horse essentially turns Scrapper into a permanent asset with the free trigger, spend one resource to gain plus one to any test you please. That's pretty damn cool. Now, this card doesn't go in every deck. For example, Dark Horse has no business being in my combo Wendy deck because that deck relies heavily on its events to power the combo. That's something to keep in mind when you're building around Dark Horse. You'll want to focus on assets and skills more heavily than events because it will be difficult, if not impossible, to save enough resources to pay for events and squeeze a lot of value out of Dark Horse. Dark Horse is going to spawn a lot of interesting deck ideas. I've already seen it turn up in a Jenny Barnes deck, which seems counterintuitive at first because Jenny is a resource gathering machine. However, Jenny also spends a lot of those resources on boosting her stats with talents. That little extra boost from Dark Horse is just icing on the cake. Personally, I'm looking forward to testing this card in Lola Hayes, an asset that boosts Lola, Hayes, uh, Lola Hayes's abilities across the board seems strong, especially if, the, if it's the only survivor card in your deck is Dark Horse. But that's a discussion for another time. This card is powerful, and if you're building a deck with a low cost curve and a few events, uh, Dark Horse is definitely worth a look. The final card in the pack is the level 2 version of Survival Instinct, a survivor skill from the core set. It costs 2 experience and has 2 agility icons. It has the innate and developed traits, and its game text states, If this skill test is successful during an evasion attempt, the evading investigator may immediately evade each other enemy engaged with him or her, and may move to a connecting location. Now, I don't think I've ever played the core version of Survival Instincts, but I know there are some sneaky players out there who swear by it. The difference between the core and level 2 versions of Survival Instinct are fairly subtle. The core version allows the invading, evading investigator to disengage from each other enemy, while this one allows them to immediately evade each other enemy. 
Evading all enemies is obviously better than disengaging, especially if any of those enemies are hunters. And the two agility icons will go a long way to ensuring the evade check is successful. While I haven't played with this card with the card personally, I can see how it would be useful in scenarios such as the house always wins or undimensioned and unseen. In either of those scenarios, the threat of becoming cornered by multiple enemies is high, and the level 2 version of Survival Instinct provides an answer to that. This probably isn't the first card you're going to spend your hard-earned experience points on, but if you're counting on evasion to get you out of sticky situations, you can't go wrong with a copy or two, copy or two of this card in your deck. So those are the player cards in Undimensioned and Unseen. Overall, I think all of the classes receive at least one interesting card in this pack. There's a nice mix of power cards like Inquiring Minds and cards to spur a deck builder's creativity such as Expose Weakness, Alyssa Graham, and Dark Horse. There are a couple duds in this pack. Obviously, I'm not a big fan of either the Springfield M1903 or Opportunist. I just don't think they're worth the experience points when better options exist. Uh, but your mileage may vary. Test them out, put them in your deck, test them out, and see how they work for you. So which cards from this pack are you looking forward to playing? Drop me a line in the comments down below and let me know. I'm interested in hearing your, uh, your take on the cards in this pack. That's going to do it for my review of the player cards from Undimensioned and Unseen. If you enjoyed this review, I'd appreciate it if you would leave me a thumbs up. Do you agree, disagree with my review, or just want to chat about this great game? Please leave a comment down below. Make sure you hit that subscribe button to be notified of when I release future content. If you'd like to contact me, I can be reached at manfromlang at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at manfromlang. Until the stars are right, keep your shotgun close and your elder sign closer. Take care out there and happy investigating.